Hello future MDs, here's part 2 of our psychology review. For those who are not aware yet, psychology is part of the social science coverage of ENMA. Our discussion for today will be about emotions, principles of growth and development, theories of learning, and theories of personality. So maraming matatakel na topics ngayon. And our lecturer here is Ms. Gabrielle Kekegan. She is a graduate at University of Santo Tomas with a degree of Bachelor of Science in Psychology. Please subscribe to this channel if you think that this will help you in preparation for your NMAP. Also, if you want to send help for this channel, you can donate an amount to the coffee platform. I just put the link below. Ayon, let's keep this intro short and let's start. So we're having our second part of the end material regarding psychology. And then the topics to be covered are emotions, principles of growth and development, EOL, EOP, and psychopathologies and therapy, social psychology, and social behavior. Okay, first is emotions. So basically, emotions is a complex psychological state that involves the following distinct components, which is you need to have a whole organism response so this is as uh, due to a psychological arousal. Basically, you need to have a movement, or you need to feel something like, for example, a fast heartbeat or um, sweating, something like that. The next is expressive behavior. So again, so connected to that, you need to have movement. So for example, you start blinking so fast because that's your reaction towards a certain emotion. So you need to have that. And then the next one is conscious experience, meaning you're experiencing something. So for example, kung dumaan yung crush mo, yun yung experience mo. And then that's how you get the emotions. Okay. So due to this, we have theories. We have three theories regarding emotions. So the first one is the James Launch theory. So when it comes to this, it means lang na there's a stimulating event that triggers a physical reaction. Ang sinasabi lang niya is that kapag yung may nangyari, may specific na physical reaction na mangyayari. So, for example, kunyari, for a typical high school student, kunyari, nadaan mo yung crush mo. Tapos biglang tumaas yung heart rate mo. Ang sinasabi ni James Launch Theory na yung reaction mo doon, which is yung increased heart rate, is the reason why you are happy. Hindi because of the event, dahil bumilis yung heart rate mo. Yun yung nagsasabi sa'yo na pasasya ka. Okay, next is the Canon Bar Theory. Basically, siya yung counterpart ni James Launch Theory. Ang sinasabi naman niya is that uh, physiological arousal can happen even though you will not experience emotion. So, ano ibig sabihin nun? So, normal naman na, kunyari, kapag tamatakbo ka, if you're running, your heart beat goes faster. But that doesn't mean you're happy, you're sad, you're angry. Wala ka namang nararamdaman. Basta tumatakbo ka, kaya pumipilis yung heart beat mo. So, yun yung sinasabi ni Canon Bar Theory. Another one na kinakounter niya with James Launch is that physiological reactions happen too slowly. So, ibig sabihin nun, masyadang mabagal yung katawan natin na mag-process ng emotions. So, for example, nasa dark alley ka, and then may narinig ang sound. Di ba usually, before ka mag-react, you would feel the rush of mararamdaman yung takot. Kapag nangyari yun, saka katatakbo. So, Ang sasabi kasi James Launch is you have to have a reaction on your body first before you feel the emotion. But ang sinasabi ni Canon Bard is no. Ang nangyayari is that oh, masyadong mabagal yung katawan mo para ma-process yung emotion. So emotions first before your physical reaction. So next naman, yung isa pa yung kinakounter kay James Launch is that people experience emotions differently. So for example, for a person, kunyari, kapag takot ka, if you're afraid, or you're angry, your reaction is almost the same. But it just differs on how you see it. Diba? So yun yung sinasabi ni Canon Bar Theory na no, no James Launch, one physical reaction does not mean it's equal to this emotion. So don't say like that. Talo. And then here comes two-factor theory. So two-factor theory naman sinasabi, you're both right, but let's tweak it a little bit. So here, he agrees to both of them. Kaya tinawag siyang two-factor theory. It's because he got something from James Launch's theory, which is the physiological arousal. And the canon bar theory, yung nagsasabi na you need to have a cognitive interpretation. So, ganun lang yung story ng no? tatlong theory na yan. Okay, next is the principles for growth and development. Alright, so here are the key areas of this um, theory. 
So for Piaget, cognitive theory, there's what you call schema. So schema is how you make sense of things, basically. And then this is how you categorize and make sense of whatever is happening around you. And then for PhD's cognitive theory, kasi, it starts with um, being a baby up to when you become an adult. So children are actively engaging in the learning process. And in the changing cognitive structures, you have the equilibrium, the assimilation, and the accommodation. So I'll be showing you the stage of the cognitive development. So let's start with the sensory motor stages. So that's from birth to two years old. So basically, what happens is that they cannot differentiate self from objects. So they don't see that they already know, okay, this is a person, and then this is a thing. And then they get to develop all of their knowledge through their five senses, which is the touch, smell, sight, and taste. And then they also get to understand um, object permanence. So object permanence, so example, for babies kasi, kapag yung bola nasa likod ng wall, di ba isipin nila wala na? But during this time, for around two years old, they get to understand that just because they don't see the ball dun sa likod ng wall does not mean that ball does not exist. So that's what they, that's what they call object permanence. Right? So next is the pre-operational stage. So this one, they are already known for talking. So they already babble, they already try to understand, they already try to use language, and they represent objects by birds and images. So for example, this time they already know um, what a ball is, what a cat is. So they can already say that that is a cat. So something like that. And then during this time, uh, as you would see next in the further theories, they are egocentric during this time. Egocentric meaning they only think about themselves. They do not understand what others feel they don't understand they don't really care about others all they think about is pleasuring themselves and alleviating pain and then after that after the pre-operational stage we go to concrete operational stage so this is from 7 to 11 years old now during this time they already start to think logically and they start to think about objects and events and they use logical rules meaning they already know how to solve problems so they already know the concept of height weight and speed during this time, they also already develop the sense of conservation and they already understand what that means or they already know how to save things. Next is the formal operational stage. So that's 12 years old to 15 years old. Now, during this time, they already think in a more flexible way. So it's almost like concrete operational stage, but in a more advanced way. So they already think about abstract concepts, and they also go for symbols. So for example, they already get to understand, um, what they call in math, for example, they get to understand algebra, and they get to grasp some things regarding that. They also start to question things. So they then become hypothetical, and they also tend to think about the future. Right? Um, next theory, which is Goldberg's theory of moral development. Now, this one, there are three levels, and then there are six stages, right? So we have the pre-conventional stage, conventional stage, and the post-conventional stage, all of which have two stages within. Okay, so first is the pre-conventional morality. So now this talks about how do they develop their morals. So first is obedience and punishment. So this is the earliest stage. So when we start with this stage, the earliest moral that they get to understand is that there are rules and fixed, and they are fixed and absolute. So they need to obey the rules. Next is stage two. They need to understand individualism and exchange. So this one, they get to understand the moral development of individual. So it means that everybody have their own points of views, and they get to understand that everybody's different. Next is conventional morality, the level two. So, which has interpersonal concordance and law and order. So, for interpersonal concordance or interpersonal relationships, in this stage, we are now focused on the expectations of others, of society. So, we already get to understand that our morals should be aligned with the social expectations and rules that is um, set in our society, um, basically conformity. Next is law and order. So, here, this time, during this stage, we get to understand that they consider society as a whole when they make judgments. So they when they um like in the second stage, uh, like in the first stage that about uh, they are talking about law and order. This time 
we are now spreading out to that everybody should maintain the law and follow them. So it's not only for you, it's already for everyone else. So by following the rules, they are doing one's duty and respecting authority. So let's go to level three, which is the social contract and universal ethical principle. So for stage five, we get to understand the social con- contract. So people begin to um, understand that there are different values and opinions of other people. This um, the social contract, this is an important thing in maintaining a society. But this are like it's an unri- it's an unwritten contract, meaning this is what the members of society have agreed on all throughout the years. And um, even though it's not really stated in pen and paper, it's like the standard. Like everybody knows that this is the standard of becoming uh, a respectable person in society. Well, the last stage is now the universal ethical principle. So people follow this intrinsically. People follow um, their principles of justice. So if you would see from stage one to stage five, you are more of looking into society, following the rules, following the laws, following the social construct. Now, when it comes to stage six, you get to decide or they get people get to understand that there are principles. You have your own principles of justice. And even though it's against the written law and rules, you are following that principle that you have. Okay, next is the OP. So this is a little bit of um, what they call this, something that you need to take note of because there's a lot of theories that I'll be discussing. So let's talk about Freud. I think Freud is the most well-known psychologist in our time. So first is that we have the psychoanalytic theory. So psychoanalytic theory is proposed by Sigmund Freud. Uh, he actually created this because of his childhood. That's why this is the anchor of his theory that childhood sexuality and unconscious motives influence personality. So this is more of sex and drive. So we have the levels of mental life. So we need to take note of the word levels of mental life. So we have the unconscious, the pre-conscious, and the conscious. To make things short, unconscious, this is our instinct. It is our libido, basically. It's like our libido. This drives us into doing something, for example, to do our instincts. The unconscious also drives into our consciousness in a distorted way. You need to take note of the word unconscious because um, later on in some of the theories, this would also come up. Okay, so unconscious behavior, according to Freud, is if you know the term Freud and slip, kunyari may sinabi ka, pero you don't know why, but magigla mo siyang nasabi. That's what you call Freud and slip. Parang yun, uy, nadulas, yung sinasabi. Yun yung sinasabi na for Freud and slip. According to Freud, that came from your unconscious. He actually meant it, but you didn't want to say it. So that's what unconscious is. For pre-conscious, this is where we readily get our memory. So this contains not in awareness, but we can easily get information from it. So if you want to remember something, you just get it from your pre-conscious. And in pre-conscious, this is where you get, for example, you do something. And then you tend to forget it. But if you want to retrieve it, you can just like try to remember it. It will be retrieved in pre-conscious. Now in conscious, naman, this is readily available for us. So this is on the top of the iceberg. So this gets the external stimuli this gets oh you get the perception there from your external stimuli and then yeah basically that's what you're using right now okay so as you can see there's this one the Freudian iceberg model so this is your conscious your pre-conscious and your unconscious there's what you call provinces of the mind so the provinces of the mind is different from what i said a while ago which is a levels of mental life so you'll see what it is so there's the it the id is the partner of the unconscious. So basically, id or das is, that's the German term. This is the pleasure principle. So it's very illogical. Its primary process is to satisfy or alleviate the pain. So whatever it takes, just to alleviate the pain, that's it. And whatever makes you pleasurable, this is where sex drive happens. Right. And then um, the ego, which is das ik. This is governed by the reality principle. This is your ego. Sorry. So for your ego, it's between your pre-conscious and your unconscious. 
So that's responsible for reconciling your id and your super ego. This is the more realistic part of your brain. Um, realistic part of your mind. So it is the one that makes your decision making. And it protects itself by being anxious. So um, that's one of the theories of Freud that your ego is protecting itself when it's anxious or um, it has its defense mechanism. And then to note, um, there is no energy of its own, but it borrows its energy from it. Okay, so next is the superego or the uber ek. So this one is the idealistic principle. So this one, superego. Super ego just wants you to be perfect. It is the most idealistic part of your mind. It just tells you to be socially acceptable. And then when you are not social, when you feel like you're not socially accepted, inferiority feelings pop in, meaning you feel that you did not meet the standards of perfection that you have set yourself in your super ego. Right? So we have the psychoanalytic theory. So this is um, the stages of development according to Freud. So Freud saw psychosexual development from birth to maturity. This psychosexual stages is how you find pleasure or how you find um, your personality. So first is the infantile period. This is subdivided to three subphases, which is the oral, anal, and the phallic space. Right. So let's start with the oral phase. Basically, you get your pleasure from something um, you, using your mouth. Next is anal phase. Anal phase is the excretory function, meaning it's a distinct anal, meaning you get pleasure from bowel movement. Right. And then phallic stage is for the genitals. For phallic space, this is mostly your coping mechanism for sensual sexual feelings. So during the phallic phase, it is said by what they call this. It is said by Sigmund Freud that you feel like you want to have sexual interactions with your your. If you're a girl, you get it with your father, or if if you're a male, you're going with your mother. And then during the phallic phase, you also get to have this what you call penis envy for women. Girls would like to have that kind of power of the penis. Right. So for latency period, they already get to understand its sexual urges and it quietly goes down. So they understand that having that kind of feelings towards the opposite sex parent is wrong and they get to understand that they need to suppress these feelings. Genital period is where puberty happens. So this is where the genital aim is eros and it continues throughout adulthood. So you're starting to understand that you are growing up and then you're having emo- these weird emotions. And it gets to understand that you are falling in love and similar to that. Now, the last part, it's not here, but the last part is maturity. In maturity, this is where the ego would be in control of the aid and the superego in which the consciousness, consciousness would be a more important role in behavior. So meaning in maturity, you are now conscious of everything you do. You do not let your id or your ego get the better of you. You're already controlling your id and your super ego. So you're, you already know what is real and what is not, what you can and you cannot do. Right next is um, theories of Jung. So this is the Jung's analytical theory. Now, if you would see in here, Jung is actually one of the best friends of Freud before. So but they had a fallout when they had a conversation about dreams. Okay, so here, Jung focused, like Freud, on the unconscious and the conscious mind. Though the difference is that uh, he believed that the conscious has played more of a role in controlling our thought process. Okay, so here's the difference between Jung and, Jung and Freud. So for Jung, Jung believed that our emotions influence the conscious mind, while Freud believes that the unconscious is driven by aggression and sex. So not because of any emotions. Now, for um, the Jung also believed that the consciousness, the conscious mind, constructively works with our emotions. While Freud believes that the conscious mind crushes our emotions. For Jung, consciousness builds up our emotions, and then Freud believes that the consciousness just destroys our emotions. Very two different ways of seeing things. And then for dreams. When it comes to Jung, he believed that the dreams happen because of different aspects of human life. While Freud believed that dreams is the manifestation of something that 
that person really, really desires. For Jung, um, it's multi-sectoral. For Freud, it's only because of human desire. So your innermost human desire. Jung believed that there are two attitudes and four functions. So the attitude, that means this is how you react towards something. So you have introvert and extrovert. Just a quick walk through to it. Introvert, they keep them themselves. Extrovert, they're easygoing. They get better if they're around people. Right? For functions, introverts and extroverts can combine with any of or more of the four functions. So there's thinking, feeling, sensing, and intuition. intuition. Okay. So thinking, this is um, how do they recognize something or what is the meaning of what they see or what they feel. So feeling gives them the value of worth. Sensing tells people that something exists. And intuiting is allowing them to know about it without knowing what they know. So that's basically intuition. According to Jung, there's a compendium of opposites. So if you have introverted, there's a person who's extroverted. That's supposed to be rational versus irrational. right? And then there's male-female, conscious and unconscious. And there are people who are pushed by past events. There are um, some things that are being pulled by expectations. Right. For the levels of psyche, just like Freud, he has conscious, but this time he has personal unconscious and collective unconscious. So for conscious, ego as the center of consciousness, but does not, but it's not the core of personality. Now for personal unconscious, so we have uh, psychic images not sensed by the ego. So these are the complexes and collective unconscious, which includes various archetypes. So take note of the word archetype because I'll be discussing more of this later. Okay, so for collective unconscious, we have our personal experience that originate from the repeated experiences of our ancestors. So personal unconscious, this is what you underwent. Collective unconscious is things that you know because of the experiences of the people before us. So not inherited ideas, but rather they refer to in a tendency to react in a particular way. So for example, if you see a snake, you run. Because it is in our collective unconscious that the snake is poisonous. It works that way. Right? So now let us go to the archetypes. So archetypes are contents of the collective unconscious. So this came from repeated experience. Again, repeated ex- experience of our ancestors. And they're expressed in certain types of dreams, fantasies, delusions, and hallucinations. So these are the archetypes that you might encounter. So persona is the side of our personality that we show to others. Shadow, this is the opposite of persona. There are the things that we do not want others to know more, uh, to know about us. Okay, the anima. Anima is for men. And then for animals is for women. But it doesn't mean that anima is only for men or anima is only for women. But anima is for you to accept their feminine side. They need to understand that sometimes we have irrational moods and feelings. And animus is more of the irrational thinking. Uh, ra- um, that people have irrational thinking and opinions from time to time. The great mother, this is mostly for nourishment and destruction. Wise old man, the archetype for wisdom and meaning. Hero, that um, basically we just want to feel that we just relieved ourselves from evil or we conquered the problem. So that's usually the hero. And then self is the most comprehensive archetype. This is we felt completion, fulfillment, and perfection. So we feel that we are happy with ourselves. So the ultimate psychological maturity is self-realization. This is usually symbolized by Matala or perfect geometric figure. Right? So dynamics of personality. So personality can happen. It's either causality and teleology or progression and regression. Okay, so for causality, it holds that the present events have their origin in previous experiences. So causality, present things happened because of the previous experience. Teleology, present events is motivated by the future. So causality, past, teleology, future. Progression and regression. Progression is the adaptation to the outside world that involves forward flow of psychiatric energy, while regression is the adaptation of the inner world. So it goes backwards. So, so progression is your energy going out. Regression is your energy going in. All right. 
So now we have the development of personality. So basically, you believe that personality develops through a series of stages that culminate in individualization or self-realization. So we have I already discussed your stages of development a while ago. And then we also have your self-realization and individualization. So here in self-realization, individualization, it is a psychological rebirth and an integration of various parts of the site. So this time in self-realization, we are already in our highest level of human development. Okay, so now for Eric Erickson's psychosocial development. During this time, Eric, so Eric Erickson is from the post freudian psychology. The emphasis during this time is that the emphasis is on the ego rather than the it functions, and ego is the center of personality. Now, this thinking of ego in the post freudian psychology is interrelated into these three facets. So we have the bot ego, ego ideal, and ego identity. Do not be confused. Body ego is how we see ourselves from other people. Ego ideal is how we see ourselves versus how we see ourselves ideally or how society has created the ideal person. Ego identity is what are the roles that we play in society. Do we have a positive impact in our society? Is it the society accept the role that we play? So basically, that's the interrelated facets in Eric Erickson psychosocial development. All right. So here, we also have society's influence. So like what I said a while ago, society shapes the ego. And there's what he calls pseudo-species. This is the notion that we are superior to other cultures. So if you would think of um, one of these concepts, it's like white supremacy. For example, the white people are more superior or European people are more superior than Asians. So that's what you call to the species. So they feel that they are more superior than other cultures, like for example, Asians or maybe the Eastern people. So yeah. So there's epigenetic principle. So here in the man, we have a step-by-step -step group. So this is the principle that Eric Erickson used. Okay. So I won't delve much into this but yeah, here are the stages, and then here are your psychosexual mode, psychosocial crisis. Okay, I'll just explain the header. So this is the psychosexual mode, meaning this is somewhat like Freud's, what they call it. This is more like, how do they find pleasure? So this is our this is our respiratory, blah, blah, blah. And then psychosocial crisis. So this is a black and white thing. So if you get basic trust, then you would move on to autonomy. So you need to fulfill either one. So if you fulfill the mistrust, then the next stage is that you will have shame and doubt and it would go on and on and on. Right? So basic strength meaning if you get the uh, if you get the positive part of the psychosocial crisis, you will get hope. If your core pathology is when you get mistrust or when you get the negative part, you get withdrawal. You get the answer for your psychosocial crisis through your significant relation, which is here, your significant relation. So here in infancy, if the mothering one or the person taking care of you establishes basic trust, then your basic strength would be. If your significant relation mother here, like for example, they don't breastfeed you, they don't take care of you, you get the psychological crisis of mistrust, thus getting the car pathology withdrawal. Right. So now this is, I guess, I think you already know this. This is the hierarchy of needs. Uh, I already discussed this in the previous session, but I'll just run through this. So this is Maslow's holistic dynamic theory. Basically, we need to satisfy the ones at the bottom before you get to the top, which is self-actualization. Right. So here you need to have your psychological needs addressed first before you go to safety, and then next to the love and belonging. The next esteem, and then that's the self actualization. As you can see, self actualization is on top and it's in that area because not a lot of people have reached that need, which is self actualization. Mostly they, they are on the esteem at most. All right, so next is Sheldon's body types. Here, he split the personality through body types. So we have the endomorph, mesomorph, and the ectomorph. He described it as if you are an endomorph. Uh, if your body looks like this, usually you're a relaxed person, and then this um the shape here is what you look like. 
So endomorph, you are usually relaxed. Mesomorph, they are muscular and they're usually active. Ectomorph, they are lean and they're really, really thin. So he described them as quiet and fragile. TOL, all right. TOL are theories of learning. So theory or the approach that we're going to be going for today is behavioral approach. So behavioral psychology is the study of external behavior. And this is an objective approach and an observable one. So whereas what goes in one's mind can never really be known or measured. So this approach, like what I said in the first session, this is they measure things through objective and observable behaviors. So there are two behavioral approaches that is commonly used and commonly talked about, which is uh, Ivan Petrovich Pavlov and Uris Frederick Skinner. They are two psychologists that are usually talked about when it comes to behavior. Now, we will differentiate between the two because a lot of people um, interchange them or they don't really understand much on it. So we have the classical conditioning and the operant conditioning. So for Ivan Pavlov, for classical conditioning, it explains that some very learning of involuntary and emotional psychological responses could, could happen. And then this experiment is the well-known Pavlov's dog. For Skinner, he does um, the operation of reinforcing stimulus and it increases the operand. So he, does, he did the Skinner's dog. So we, have a, we need to understand these ones. We have reinforcement. Skinner said that they are positive, negative, punishment, and extinction. Right. So positive, this is a strengthening of behavior by praise. This is all good. Negative, strengthening of behavior by removal or avoidance of offense. Example, avoiding harm. Right. Punishment. Punishment is weakening a behavior. You might interchange negative and punishment. So negative is removal of the unpleasant event, while punishment is giving unpleasurable events. Okay, so for punishment, you give pain. Negative, you remove the pain. Okay. Extinction is weakening the behavior by removal of rewarding effect. So meaning this is the opposite of positive. Positive, you give praise. You give positive. Um, you give um what the person wants. Extinction is removing of what the person wants. Okay, so let's talk about classical conditioning first. All right, so um you can see the illustration, right? All right, but I think um, I have a better... Um, what they call this? I have a better example. Okay, so for example, you have a crush or you like someone. Uh, uh, every time um, you see them, you give them a candy. And then they would talk to you. You would do that every day. So after some time, when they see you, automatically they think about candy. And thus, they would say hi to you. That is how the classical conditioning works. First, you give them something that is something that they want. And then they have a response to that. So for example, here, we have the food. Whatever they see food, they salivate, right? Now you would add, you would add a bell to it, which is your neutral stimulus. So now your experiment would go, you hit the bell. After you hit the bell, there is food and thus creating the response. After some time, after you condition this dog or this person, Whenever they hear a bell, they automatically respond to it by salivating. Let's go back to my example a while ago. Now, what is your unconditioned stimulus? That is your can. What is your unconditioned response? Your crush saying hi. Now, what is your neutral stimulus? Your neutral stimulus is whenever they see you when you pass by. And your conditioned response is they don't really care. They don't really, like, you know, they don't really see you. Now, what is the condition? What is your, what will you do during conditioning? They would see you first, and then you would give the candy, and thus having the reaction of that person say hi. Now, you continue doing that every day. Now, after the conditioning, when they see you, they automatically say hi to you because they correlated you to the candy. All right, so before conditioning, they see food, the unconditioned stimulus. Siya yung reason kung bakit gano'n yung response ng dog. Now, itong food na to, ipapartner mo siya dito sa bell, which is another, which is a neutral stimulus. Yung neutral stimulus kasi it means na parang wala na pa talaga siyang connection sa dog or connection sa food. Wala talaga siyang connection to anything. Siya yung ikakabit mo 
dito kay food para makuha mo yung response na kapag nakita niya lang yung food. Right? Next is the operant conditioning. Dito naman, kung, kung kay classical conditioning, kailangan maipapakita ka muna or maibibigay ka muna bago mo makuha yung reaction. Kay operant naman is you do the behavior first before you get your punishment or you get your reward. So, yun yung nangyari dun kay skin response. Ang ginagawa ni mouse is every time nakikita niya na green yung light, ipupush niya yung button. Thus, him getting the reward. Kapag ano naman, kapag nakita niya yung red, yung ilaw, kapag hinawakan niya yan, magkakaroon siya ng punishment. So, for example, real life experience. Para sa bata, when they do something good, you give them a star stamp or you give them a star or something na gusto nila. Pag yung bata na yon, may ginawang masama, yung thing that they like would be removed. Ganun yung operant conditioning. Dapat may behavior muna bago mabigyan ng reward or ng punishment. So, ayun lang. Yun lang yung difference nila. Si operant, behavior first before um, your stimulus or your reward or punishment. Kay classical conditioning naman, dapat may may reward or may stimulus muna bago magkaroon ng reaction or ng behavior. So yan, yeah, um, this is basically the summary of it. Si classic kala may association, yung voluntary response mo to the stimulus. Si operant naman, voluntary behavior before a consequence or a reward. Right? So, merong schedule si case scanner. Let's go back to scanner. So, we have continuous, interval, ratio, and extinction. So, si continuous, tuloy-tuloy lang. Every time may tamang ginawa or may, may gusto ka reinforce na action and ginawa siya, lagi binibigyan. That's your continuous reinforcement. Si interval, always remember it is time. Dapat may minimum amount of time bago makuha yung, yung reward or makakuha sila or makakuha na rin reward or punishment. So, um, and then, si ratio naman, always remember, they are the responses. So, again, interval, kailangan may time. Si ratio, dapat may responses or may behavior. Si extinction naman is kapag may discontinue pa. So, i-remove mo lang siya basically. Okay, ito yung difference na lang lahat. So, if you see the color red one, that's your interval. The yellow one is your ratio. So here, si interval, sinasabi niya na dapat may min 5 minutes, 10 minutes, 15 minutes, or 20 minutes. So, kanyari, si fix, ibig sabihin, lagi siyang nangyayari, kanyari, lagi siyang nangyayari every week, lagi siyang nangyayari every 15 minutes. So, every time they respond to that or nagawa nila during that time, may reward sila or may punishment. Ano example ng fixed interval? Study for a weekly quiz or paycheck every week. So, that's your behavior. Nag-aaral ka every week kasi may quiz ka every week. May, may na-receive ka na paycheck every two weeks. So, ganun lang si fixed interval. Next, yung k-variable niya, ito naman, random naman siya. Ano yung random behaviors na ginagawa mo? It's, it's like checking an email or winning a video game. So, diba, you do your behavior, kunyari, at random siya. Wala namang, wala namang ginagawa. Kunyari, yung email naman, hindi naman siya pumapasok every hour. Diba? Ganun yung ibig sabihin niya by... And, um, variable interval. Now, for ratio, again, it's about the responses or the behavior. So, for example, yung mga discounts. Kapag bumili ka ng ganito karami, may libre ka. So, that's fixed ratio. So, for example, alam mo yung patulad kay Starbucks, diba, yung card nila. Yung card na yun, you need to get stamps every, um, for Christmas. And then you get something. That's fixed ratio. You visit them this amount so, for example, um, 15 times ka dapat mag-visit at bumili para makuha may reward. That's fixed ratio, right? Kasi ginawa may behavior in a specific time. Pinyal, 15 responses or 15 times. Si variable ratio naman, at random yung action. So, this is gambling. It's like gambling. So, hindi mo alam kung kailan mo makukuha yung action na yon, ay makukuha yung reward na yon. not unless you do it over and over again. Pero hindi mo alam kung kailan. So, for example, gambling and lottery. Diba in lottery, lagi kang taya ka ng taya ng taya. Pero hindi mo alam kung kailan mo makukuha yung reward. Kung makukuha mo talaga yung reward. So, that's variable ratio. Next is kay Bandura. So, Bandura's social learning. So, we have the observational learning. Yung ibig sabihin nga lang sa observ- observational learning is 
just because you learn something doesn't mean your behavior will change. So they can just learn through observing, but they won't really learn anything. So ganun siya. Yun lang ibig sabihin niya. So there are three basic models of observing learning. So there's live model. Live model, they are watching somebody that's actually moving. Ginagaya nila or natututo sila by physically learning it. So kanyari, sa pagluluto, diba? um, tinuturuan, if you're a kid, tuturuan ka kung paano mag-chop ng onion. So that's live model. They see kung paano ginagawa isang bagay. A verbal instructional model naman, this involves yung explanation. So in the explain, sinasabi, binibigyan ng instructions. The symbolic model naman, basically these are movies, books, yung something na ano, na hindi naman nila nakikita, hindi rin naman nila naririnig, but they understand it. May through reading or watching, using their eyes. Right? So, there's a modeling process that happens in Bandura social learning, which is they first need to have attention. They need to have retention. Retention dapat na intindihan nila, naalala nila. Reproduction is they get to do whatever they learned, whatever they saw, learned, in a way na the tama, na replicate nila. Si motivation naman, this is yung kailangan siya kasi ito yung motivation, ito yung reason kung bakit nila ginagawa yung behavior na yun. So, ganun lang siya. Um, this is mostly reinforcement and punishment for motivation. Right? So, we have intrinsic reinforcement. From the word intrinsic, we learn yung reinforcement niya is because they want to. So, they don't, ha- there's no external stimuli that is telling them to do this or hindi nila, wala silang gusto i-achieve in a physical sense. So, note that external environmental reinforcement was not, not the only factor to influence learning. So, ito yung isa sa mga reinforcements na ginagamit ng ibang tao. Right? So, what do we know about social learning so far? So, we have people can learn through observation. Mental states are important at learning, and learning does not necessarily need to behavior change. So just because you learn something doesn't mean that something would change with your behavior. In a nutshell, in that long be- um, behavioral theories, we have the classical, operant, and observational. So for classical, again, you need to have something to associate with, or may kailangan mo nang ibigay bago mo makuha yung, bago yung response. Operant, dapat may response muna bago yung punishment or reinforcement. Si observational naman, just because you learn something doesn't mean that you actually put it into behavior. Though, you can learn through watching and learning through observation. Alright, so psychopathologies and therapy, kaya pa? Thank you so much for studying with me. If ever you found corrections, feel free to comment below para makorrect natin. And also, if you have some other resources, feel free to comment below para matulungan din natin yung other NMAT takers. If this channel has helped you, please consider subscribing. You can also share this with your friends who also need NMAT review resources. That's all. 